experience. I met a guy that uh, had been on the ground troops. His name was Tony Aguilar. And uh, he, he said, you were one of the pilots that flew in the 201? Yes, I was. I saw you when you were bombing strafing ahead of us. And I saw the flag, the Mexican flag. And I would tell my friends there, there's the Mexicans flying. They wouldn't believe it. I was a soldier and I received orders. And, and I repeat, it was a great honor. As a Mexican, it was a double honor to, to, to do something for my country. The main plaza in Mexico City, the Socolo, was quiet that day in 1942 when the announcement came over the radio. Mexico had entered the war. In Mexico's eyes, the true enemy was Hitler's Third Reich. After all, the Germans were the ones responsible for sinking the oil tankers in the Gulf of Mexico. As a symbol of solidarity, President Franklin Roosevelt met with Mexican President Manuel Avila Camacho in April of 1943. This marked the first time an American president had traveled to Mexico. The meeting brought about better cooperation and closer ties between the two countries. A select group of Mexican military men were chosen by competitive examination from throughout the Republic. The Mexican Expeditionary Force, as they were officially known, traveled north to the United States for instruction. This group of 300 aviators and ground personnel became known as Squadron 201. This would be the first trip out of the country for many of these men, but it also marked the first time a Mexican military unit would be trained for overseas combat duty. The send-off from Mexico was one the likes of which had never been seen before and may never be seen again. Everybody was like, uh, you know, something real big. Well, it was big mm -hmm. in the first time in history mm -hmm. for both countries, you know. Mm -hmm. So everybody that could, they went to the station, train station, mm -hmm. and you, oh, and they sing Las Mañanas, Las, Las Golondrinas. Da -da -da -da. You, know, you know the song? It's, uh, that's when they sing goodbye. Mm -hmm. They sing that. So everybody was singing that and the music on the other side and you know, she, too much excitement. And as I said, you know, he was like one block over there and for uh, us to get together and hug, you know, it was so hard, but we did. But, uh, but uh, it was something so beautiful. And they all were so enthusiastic about it. It was such a beautiful experience for them. And especially because they were, los escogieron a todos ellos. Probably the, 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 the main impression was when we were marching uh, across the, the, the border, the, the bridge on the river, one old lady saw all of us and he cried, please look back, probably this is the last time you're going to see your country. <laughs> so it makes you feel uh, sorry in one uh, sense and uh, proud in the other. Texas was a very different place in 1944, and for the Mexicans, it was a new experience. Some towns and cities were segregated, and some young Mexican recruits did experience discrimination. The first weekend that I went out with my friends, cadets of the U.S. Army Air Corps, uh, we went to a restaurant, a small restaurant, and we ordered hamburgers, something like that. And they came and brought us a hamburger. So all of a sudden, I look up in the wall. There was a sign that said, no Mexicans, no dogs allowed. And that surprised me because I, you know, living in Mexico, you don't know about discrimination and things like that, except probably the Mexican-Americans that live there. But us, 
we were strangers to that. And that surprised me, and I said, what's that sign? That means me. I told my friends, I'm getting out of here. They said, no, no, no. Wait, we called the owner. They called the manager or the owner, I don't know what. And he also said the same thing. No, this is not for you. Sit, sit, please. Forget about it. It's not, no, sir. If you were a, a Yankee, were you from the north of the Mason-Dixon line? Forget it. Uh, they weren't about to have any of those. Uh, if you were a Catholic, no Catholics. And we all were running into this. It was sickening. And the worst of all was when they said no Mexicans. And when we drove into town, the first thing that greeted me, there was a big sign up over the highway that said, the blackest land, the whitest people. The command officer called me first thing on Monday and said, uh, is it true that this happened to you? And Yes, sir, it happened. But I didn't want to report it to you, no, but I know about it. So uh, uh, this afternoon after classes are over, you and I are going to see the uh, you come with me again. So we went up to the same restaurant, and he closed it. He closed the restaurant. They opened up later on, but no sign. Chosen for the task of training the Mexican pilots in the American military system was Captain Eugene Miller. Miller had been raised in Latin America and spoke Spanish fluently. Section I, as the special organization was codenamed, would utilize experienced American fighter pilots and personnel to train the Mexicans. The American commander's first priority was the health and safety of these new pilots. Another one of the hot pilots, <laughs> unfortunately, he made the mistake of buzzing the theater one evening when my husband and I were sitting in it. And the next day, he was en route to Mexico. <laughs> my husband wouldn't tolerate that. <laughs> uh, because uh, he was concerned they not kill themselves, and he was trying to prepare them for fighting, and uh, so trying to keep tight discipline mm -hmm. and uh, just have them in the best shape possible. The training that the Mexican recruits would undergo had already been taken by thousands of American cadets. We taught such things as uh, uh, short field takeoffs, uh, short field landings, uh, formation flying, and takeoff and landing in formation to establish air discipline. Uh, we taught them uh, aerobatic maneuvers, which involved uh, stalling, looping, rolling, spinning, how to recover from a, a bad uh, configuration if you ever got into it, like, like, a, like a spin recovery. Uh, we also taught them, uh, in some cases, like to recover from a spin, not to over-control uh, for recovery from a spin, because that would could probably result in a secondary spin, which is, would be even more violent than the first one. So. Uh, you might say there were dangers involved and there was a, a certain risk, but that had to be done. Humorous incidents did occur when the men underwent the instruction on AT-6s and P-40 warbirds and eventually the P-47. They were on training and they were supposed to fly at night. And I went with my husband, I stayed in the car. Several, you know, wives. So they all start flying. And then uh, all of a sudden, you know, they were Bilches wasn't, you know, contacting them or talking with them. Whoever was down, you know, with the whatever telephone or whatever it was. And uh, so they start coming back, every, everyone. And everybody worried because what happened with Bilches, Joaquin Bilches. And uh, so finally, here he comes. And everybody, you, where were you? Where did you go? You were lost, what happened? Oh, no, he said, I was just, around that, you know, theater at night, okay. and, I, and, I, and drive in, exactly, and I was just watching a movie, terrific movie, and they, you know, they, everybody wanted to kill him because they lost that, that, you know, that training that night because of him. <laughs> 